Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind show with your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. And we have a very special guest on today. I know a lot of you guys are new, kind of getting started and look into how you can start with real estate and what you can do. And this guy, we have met through a mastermind that we are in together. And he is a stud. I mean, he is big time. He is somebody that I've heard speak on stage and sat back and said, I'm going to listen to this guy. And I've been very impressed by what he's done. Plus, his accent is just cool as hell, which is good. So that's all, that's all good. You can listen to him all day. Yep. But I, I want to introduce uh, him to you today. So we have Mark Delator here. Mark is the CEO of SBD Hous Housing. He's written the book, Mistake Free Real Estate. I want to hear more about that. They've done over 1,500 homes in the Midwest, and they do a lot of turnkey. And I'm going to have to explain a lot today about what turnkey is and what that is. So Mark, welcome to our show. Thank you so much, Glenn. Amber, great to see you guys. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So our, our listeners, a lot of people that are listening to our podcast, you know, might be just getting started out. They've done a few deals and they aspire to be at a level that you're at. I'd like to go back before we see, talk about what you do and talk about how you got there. Cause I think that's important. People, so the many, journey. yeah, so many people just don't understand the journey that we all go through us and you, they don't understand. They think that we woke up one day and have done thousands of deals and that's just not we all, we all know that's not true, right? So but we don't, people don't know that when they first meet us, they're like, oh my God, they must have had a silver spoon. Everything's easy for them. And they figured it out. I've only done mm -hmm. one deal, but I bet you, you remember your first deal. hundred percent. I remember my first deal. Um, yeah, no, look, I, I think my encouragement to your audience at first would just be simply that um, I was once where they were. Um, I had not done any real estate. Um, I came over from, I was born and raised in New Zealand. I came over to this country on the back of an athletic scholarship, uh, went to university and played tennis, um, got my undergraduate degree, um, stayed on and got my master's degree. And during that time, I had started an advertising company with my future father-in-law. And we had patented an idea to put advertising inside commercial aircraft. Well, then September 11th hits. So this is 2001. Yes, I am old, Glenn. Um, so September 11th hit and just kind of destroyed, obviously, advertising inside a commercial aircraft. Uh, you know, that was such a maverick idea. Clearly, the timing was off. You know, market, whole marketing departments were just getting, you know, taken out um, of the airline industry. And it was just poor timing. What well, actually read Rich Dad Poor Dad a year before in about 1999. And I'd flipped my first house. Um, more just as a hobby. And I thought, well, gosh, I made decent money doing that. Do I really want to go, you know, having graduated and getting my MBA, newly married, do I really want to go and sit behind a desk all day uh, like my friends were at Hallmark Cards or Sprint or Cerner, all the big corporations in Kansas City? Um, and the answer was no. I thought, look, let me, uh, luckily my wife was making the big bucks, Glenn. She was making, you know, about $15 an hour as a nurse so we could survive <laughs> on that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, luckily, um, she supported me and said, look, go, you go follow your passion and, um, yeah, look, I uh, love it. First flip. I do remember my first and, um, it starts with one and then, yeah, goodness, looking back 1500 homes later, it's been a hell of a ride. Tell us what that first flip was like. So that first flip was a what? Now you do You do a lot of turnkey now, which we'll talk to everybody about what that is in just a minute. But I, I'm, I don't know if that was a turnkey or not. I don't, I don't know what no, your first Yeah, it was, was a retail flip. So um, the very first one I did was a referral from a um, one of my buddies who was a new home builder. And um, he had just decided um, to take one in on trade. And he said, hey, these people um, don't want anybody... Uh, you know, coming through their home, they they uh, they were actually of Japanese descent and just didn't like the idea of people traipsing through with shoes on through their home. And so, um, again, and you know now, there's just so many different motivations. It's the strange motivations sometimes that that give you lead you the best deal. And they just wanted a quick cash closing. And I never done a deal before, but um, borrowed some money from my father and uh, and my father-in-law, I think, to pull some funds. So we paid cash and closed in a couple of weeks. A so really good. And I think we bought it for eighty. And um, I you know kind of you know, nuts and bolts kind of, you know, put everything back together, cleaned it up, cleaned it out, put a little bit of granite in there. We painted it. Um, I didn't even really know what I was doing. Um, but yeah, accidentally made, uh, you know, north of 20 grand. And I thought, well, hey, that's not bad for, you know, a first flip. See if I could do that again. Yeah. So what, what year was that in, Mark? 2000, late 2000, mid 2001, right before September 11th. 2001. So we're in 2021. So that's 20 years ago. So in 20 years, you've flipped 1500 houses. Yeah, I just started off one at a time. Um, obviously, we've gained momentum. Um, this year, we should do around 300. Um, last year, we only did around 150. It was a down year and, and rebuilding year. Um, we'd consistently done over 100 homes, um, you know, for about a 10 year stretch there. So that was kind of the guts of it from 2010 through till 2020. 
So tell everybody about what you do today, because what you do today is very different, right? So today is a, I, I love, we were talking before we got started here today, and I, I'd like you to tell everybody what turnkey is, because some people are saying, what is, I never heard of that before. And if, you know, it's not something Amber and I actually do, we don't really do any turnkey stuff. And so, but I'd be very curious if you just let people know what that is and then what you do, kind of how, maybe start to take us through that journey, like how you started that and how somebody else here could start it too, right? Because I think, again, they look and say, 300 deals a year. I can't, I don't even, I don't even know what to, where to put that in my head, but maybe you say, listen, just like this, it probably started with one is my guess. For sure. Um, so it started out of necessity. So um, in 2000, 2001, it kind of talks about my journey. If you'll allow me, I'll kind of get to the turnkey in a second, but Please. from 2002, I had flipped in um, five homes and I had two guys that were kind of independently wealthy come to me and say, Hey, let's blow this up. And I thought, yeah, I was young and thought, yeah, that's great. So a three-legged partnership, um, was formed and we went from 2002 all the way through 2008. Um, but Dave Ramsey says the only ship that never sails is a partnership. And that was certainly very, very true. It ended up. I've never um, heard that before. That's interesting. <laughs> the only ship that never sails a partnership. Good. I'm sorry. I never heard that before. That's good. Yeah. I heard that one from Dave Ramsey and, and uh, you know, um, that was, it certainly played out because when you own 33% of something, the other two guys can gang up on you. And that's what happened. I was kind of shunned out of ownership. We owned 120 homes and we kind of bought and hold and we've been flipping and had a pretty successful operation, but one of them lost their job and they kind of, long story short, but it was kind of a hostile takeover of sorts. And so I was back to square one. And so now I've got, you know, no job. Um, now, operationally, I was running the entire company the entire time. So I knew exactly what to do and how to do it. And I had the people in place. So I just had to kind of start rebranding. The one thing that was I was short on was cash. And so born out of necessity with working with other people and their cash is how I survived and thrived from 2010 and onwards. And so I would go to um, my friends that, you know, weren't super wealthy, but just, you know, had some money and said, hey, look, I know you've been impressed over the years with all these homes I've been buying and flipping. And they've always said, oh, could, could I do one with you? Or, or you know, you, at dinner parties, you'd be like, oh, where do you live at? Oh, 123 Main Street. Oh, I bought a house over there the other day for 60000 uh, 60000 uh, That's worth one thirty. How did you get that? And so those kind of conversations, when people understand what you do, lead to those discussions later on saying, hey, I've got to find a deal. Would you like to be a private lender, right? So then they would effectively lend me the money and I would flip a house. Well, then it would go to the next step, which would be, hey, you know, this one is probably a better rental. Like, I don't think I'll be able to flip it, but it makes a really good cash flowing rental. Have you ever thought of building a portfolio of rental property? Yes, I have. But Mark, I don't want to deal with the hassle and the headache understand totally. How about I take, remove all of the hassle from you. I've now at that time I'd flipped, you know, probably 300 homes. Okay. So I've done this for, for seven or eight years. Now I know what I'm doing. I'll eliminate all the mistakes. Hence the, the name of my mistake free real estate. And I will buy a house for you. I'll rehab it for you. I'll get it rented out and I'll property manage it for you. And you just pay me a flat fee. And I'll, Oh my gosh, that sounds great. So I was able to get people in for about 80% of um, ARV because you're just buying homes at such a discount. Yes. So we would, you know, buy a house that'd be all in for 80,000, including my fee that it appraised at a hundred, they'd pull out 80, they'd get back in line and they'd do another deal. So that kind of was able to really gain momentum because I didn't need a lot of investors to do that. Um, so we were doing probably in that time around 40 to, to 60, 70, we're growing, but 40, 50 houses a year, just using building properties for other people. And it was just a small operation. Then when I gained momentum and start, excuse me, started accumulating some capital of my own is when I started buying it myself with my own cash, rehabbing it with my own cash, then uh, getting it rented out. And then you sell it for a premium because now you're eliminating all risk from, from the risk profile at that point. So the idea of turnkey real estate in a nutshell is simply going to somebody who doesn't want to get involved, wants to be completely hands off but they value real estate as a means of diversifying out of the stock market. So a typical client would be someone that has, you know, million dollar net worth plus that are, that understands real estate in a nutshell. I mean, they own their own home and they would love to get into real estate, but they just don't have the time. They don't have the knowledge and they don't want to mess with it because it is very messy. They partner with us and they buy a home from us with the uh, acquisition, the remodel and the property management all in place. You, you said a golden nugget in there that I want to bring to the listener's attention, though, and that is that you went to, and it's kind of similar to how we started, too, not exactly the same story, but 
our private lenders are all just regular people too. They're not yeah. overly wealthy people. And the, the thing that's the golden nugget though, is you had the conversation with them. And so many people let that fear get in the way of their lack of confidence. And, and then they just never even bring it up with the people that are around them. And that is, that is, I think way bigger than people give credit for, you know? The easiest, the easiest thing in the world is to ask, you know, the toughest thing to do is to ask someone for money. The easiest thing to do is to get the money by simply asking them, do you know someone who? Yes. Rather than saying, do we you? We do that. Same thing. We preach the same thing, right? It's so good. Yeah, they get the, you take the yeah. side door approach. Yeah, we, it's I, the side door approach. Yeah. Do you know anybody that would want to make 7% on their money? Right. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? I, do. I, I would want to make seven percent of my money. You know, yeah. so. isn't that funny? We we teach. We've been teaching that for years. That's how we did it initially. We sent out packets to all of our you know potential. And this is what fourteen it, years, yeah. fifteen years ago. We sent out packets to a bunch of people. We made up a packet online. And we we figured out how to do it just tumbling through. And we yeah we said, listen, I put a letter on front. I said, if you know of anybody, let me know. And my biggest investor called and said, what is this? What's this crap? What are you doing now? I haven't talked to you in 10 years. What is this thing? And I'm like, well, I, I'm just looking if you know anybody. He's like, well, what about me? I go, I don't know. What about you? I, you know, so it's funny how that, you know, we've had the same conversations, I'm sure. The other thing I want to give you props for is you said that kind of hostile takeover <laughs> took, uh, happened in 2008. And that was right when the market was crashing. So finding money, commercial money wasn't easy or institutional money wasn't easy. You know, it, the, the private That's money was sorry. definitely the way to go. So, so not only did you have... Um, challenges along the way, but you you really started out on your own in one of the worst times in real estate history. So we props share, to you we, for that. We share that, Mark. Yeah. Just so you know, we started, we started in, in 07. In 07. So we, yeah, we, it's, we share that. You know, two things, Amber. One thing is, you know, you could look at it as the worst time in real estate history or the greatest opportunity right. ever, right? So yeah. perspective is there. I mean, the irony is that when Walmart has a sale 50% off, everybody goes screaming to the doors you know, a Black Thursday or whatever they call it, you know, right before Thanksgiving, you know, or, you know, when real estate has a sale and it's 50% off, oh, I would never buy real estate. Real estate is so <laughs> risky. It's just, it's very ironic to me, but yeah, that was a great opportunity. And, and I remember from, I think it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad that I, the mindset has always been there for me that if a deal is good enough, money is never a problem. And I tell everybody that it's really hard to hear when you're just getting started but is the absolute truth. If the deal is good enough, Glenn, and someone's in your market and they come to you and say, hey, there's the house that's worth 150 and I know I can get it for 30,000. Would you be interested in partnering with me? Glenn? You'd be, Absolutely, all day long, let's yeah. go. All day. And those deals are out there and it's just a matter of you know, trying to get a system. And as you scale, your margins get compressed and your overhead becomes greater. I mean, you know, it sounds great to flip 300 homes, but no one wants, you know, $2 million of overhead every year. Right. So it's like, you know, pros and cons, yeah, we know. So yeah. you know, there's, you know, the being small and nimble, being able to pivot, being able to just, you know, have um, just a solo operator is, is a fun place to be. I, I think those of your audience that are listening now are thinking, you know, oh man, I don't have all, you know, this big group of people around me. Hey, that's the benefit. Keep your overhead low yeah. for as long as you can and just hustle and grind your way to success. It's, you can make some big chunks in the real estate game. Just got to keep your head down. So go back to turnkey for a minute. So turnkey as a synopsis to that. So turnkey is basically you have a pre-made buyer for your property. You flip to a pre-made buyer and then you are managing their property after you sell it to them. That's the, the bottom line. You're not going out there saying, hey, I have to find a buyer, which as you know, in today's market, it's not so hard to do anyway, but it's crazy right now. But but nonetheless, there are up there are ups and downs in all in all markets. And eventually there'll come a time when people are saying, geez, I want to, you, you will have, you know, they're looking to sell houses. You have guaranteed buyers lined up. So you have virtually no, wait time when you sell a house, right? That's kind of the beauty of your model. Yeah. So the strength of our model, and when I sit down now and talk with bankers and, and uh, you know, have conversations with them about financing operation, <clears throat> I tell them that the greatest strength we have right now is twofold. Property management, because we're really, really, really good at property management. And I, we can delve into that thing. But, the, but what we're also really good is we have all the buyers lined up. We're actually turning away buyers right now just because we have too many, uh, which is a great problem to have. But the buyers, mm. but here's the other cool thing, Glenn, is that we have buyers that are buying as an investment property based on yield, not based on what is the ARV of the asset. Now, I'm not telling you that we're turning around and selling it for 20,000 more than what it's worth. But what I am telling you is that we are selling it based on a cap rate. In the same way that multifamily is bought and sold, you'll hear people saying, I bought an apartment complex at a seven and I'm going to sell it at a five cap, right? The reason they can do that is because I know our listeners just what a cap ARV and cap we know, but just explain if you would from a ARV real quick and then cap. 
Sorry. Yeah. So ARV is after repair valuation. You know, what is the property worth after it's been fixed up? And then a cap rate is simply what is the basically for all intents and purposes, what is the percentage return on my money that I'm going to get from an investment? So if you're buying at a seven cap, that means that, you know, you're going to get 7% return on the money that you're that you're you're putting into the property yeah. or on actually on your purchase of the property. Cash on cash is how much money you put in. I want to get yeah. two in the details. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, yeah. In, in real, relative terms, you're 7% return, but then you're going to sell it to someone at a 5% return. And that may be an institutional investor. So we are selling to investors that are very savvy and they are. we've coached them into, hey, if you could buy and accumulate a properties at a seven cap, meaning you're going to get guaranteed 7% run, 7% return on your money, regardless of the appreciation of the asset over time and the depreciation tax benefits, but you're actually going to get a seven cap on your money or 7% return on your money, would you be interested? And they say, yes. So then you have them line up and you know even our marketing pieces say, your ROI is more important than the address of the property. If we get an investor that comes to us saying, well, what what, what kind of granite do you use? Or what, what color do you use on the exterior? What, what do you paint your, your bathrooms? It's like, <laughs> <too high> maintenance. <laughs> sorry, you're out. So, so the benefit there is that they're just looking at these things purely from a, um, a math perspective, IJM. It's just math. And so we always look at it from a math perspective and then we can just line them up to buy. And to your point, having them ready to go, we actually insist that all our buy sales are cash. So there's no appraisal, all, all cash purchases, and they have to close within 10 days of it coming out of rehab. So one of the big um, you know, things for us right now when you're scaling is velocity of capital. How quickly can we get from acquisition and cash going out to a sale and cash coming back in? So we've driven our time cycle down from like 7.7 months down to about 5.7 months um, where from acquisition to cash. Now that, that also includes, this may sound like a long time for some people, but remember that sometimes we'll be buying occupied properties where we have to get the tenant out and then go into rehab it and then get it sold in the back end. But we're driving down the sale time cycle of our properties as quickly as possible by insisting that they pay cash and close quickly. What was your time frame you said? Because I was actually writing the phrase "velocity of capital." I've heard that before. Maybe it was from you actually. I heard, and I, I, I love that term, "velocity of capital." But how many days is your cycle? Yeah, so we've driven it from seven point seven to five point seven. Now that's a blended average because we do obviously we do our full turnkeys, which is our turnkey sale of rental real estate, about sixty five percent. But then about thirty five percent of what we do is actually flipping retail. So that includes both. On our full turnkeys, it's actually much shorter. I think we've driven it down to around a four point two months um, for those flips. So we're getting pretty good at what we do. But the idea of velocity of capital, Glenn, is simply, if you can flip a house and make $20,000, is that a good deal? Well, the answer is it depends, right? If it takes you two years to get the $20,000, no, that's not a good deal. It's a waste of your time. <laughs> but if you can do it in two months, that's yeah. a really good return. So velocity of capital <clears throat> is essential, right? Because we look at it as man hours, or we look at it um, sometimes like cost per GC. So if we have a general contractor that's out there doing two houses at a time, and we're going to generate $20,000 per property, that's $40,000 per GC per month, right? Yeah. But if it takes him, you know, if he can only do one per month, then it's only $20,000 per GC as opposed to $40,000 per GC. So that GC is less valuable to us because he's slower and can't, you know, generate. So different ways to look at it. And again, maybe getting uh, off on a tangent, but that's, you know, the velocity of capital is very important when you're scaling a business. No, I think that, I think that, you know, <clears throat> as we're talking to people, no matter, no matter where our listeners are, whether you're just starting, or you've got a few deals going or whatever, I'm sure people, there, there's a handful of folks that look to aspire to do what we do, right. And do like the, the volume that we do. And so um, I, our, podcast is called the real estate of mind because we're real big believers that if you don't have your mind right you'll never get your money right and it just you just have to have that straight you, got, you have to battle through challenges and battle through the ups and downs of real estate investing people think because you get in real estate investing that all your problems are solved in life and you, as you know it's not we just we bring on more problems we have to know how to deal with them the only way to be successful is to deal with more problems than somebody else really has to deal with and as you're, as you're talking about things i'm thinking about a different perspective real estate of mind you really are looking at things from a different perspective than other people. Like I love that you've got your numbers so dialed and you know you're you're you know 5.5 and 7.5 months, you know you're 4.2 months on a flip, you got 65% of your you know, you know your numbers and that you you're looking at your business from a very high view, 10,000 foot view, 30,000 foot view. You're looking at your business and diving in your numbers 
and executing to, to make your goal. So I think you're you're taking the real estate of mind to another another level. I think when you want to scale, you've got to start looking at your business through a different set of lenses. True. And the the thing I got from that too was, <clears throat> um, and this is something we always teach in our home flipping workshop, is for people to not make emotional decisions. You make business decisions, and that's that's what your whole thing is about. You know, the velocity of money and IJM. The, it's just the IJM. I, you're making you're making you don't even deal with emotional buyers if if they're wondering about the paint and the granite. You're, you're only working with people that are making business decisions. So this is a time, you know, they always say get out of your head, but this is a time you want to be in your head, not in your heart, because you want to make those sound, logical business decisions. I w- Mark, I want to keep talking to you, but do me a favor, tell everybody how they can find you. I want We're going to keep talking, but I want to know how, how they can find you and look up more about Mark and all that kind oh, of Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, look, uh, probably uh, mistakefreerealestate.com would be uh, the portal that, that would, would get most people's interest um, that you can reference the podcast at that site as well as uh, if you're interested in buying the book, you can go there. So mistakefreerealestate.com. Thank you. Yeah. Glenn, one of the things you mentioned that I think for um, you know a rookie investor or someone that's you know aspiring to grow is... I always reverse engineer. I, I think of it as if I can eliminate all risk from a transaction, it makes me more comfortable, makes me sleep well at night. What's the biggest risk that you have when you're flipping a home? You've got the rehab risk, but you've also got what if the house doesn't sell risk, right? I think that's the biggest hurdle of all. Like even if you go over budget on a rehab, as long as you know it's going to sell, right. you know you can you can stomach sometimes only making five thousand on a property instead of twenty if you know if stuff happens. But the key is, will it sell? Think of turnkey real estate as it's a guaranteed sale. We've already got the buyers lined up. It's already sold. They're already agreeing to it as long as your math hits, which means you've got to get a certain amount of uh, rent for the property. The irony is, you know, sometimes people think of it as what is that house worth and what are the other houses around there selling for? We are selling at a premium in certain neighborhoods where, you know, you wouldn't be able to sell and get $100,000, you know, for the asset or, and well, maybe you'd only get a hundred thousand for the asset and we're able to get 115 because it's just a cash flowing machine. Think of a real estate house as a box that money comes out of. It's just an ATM machine, right? So it's changing the perspective. If real estate is just a, if a house is just a box that money is spitting out of, inherently it's more, the more money that comes in every month, the more you'd be willing to pay for that box to be on your balance sheet. So that's where we get to the point of if we can get in a subdivision, if we can get a rental that's getting $1,000 a month in rent, that's probably worth $115,000. If we can only get $800 a month in rent, it might only be worth $100,000. So it's all based on how much money we can get for it. So if we go in, so then IJM, if we finish out a basement and put in a bedroom and a bathroom because it's going to generate an additional $200 a month of rent, that's worth $20,000 more on the back end as a sales price. So maybe if, so then you go to, okay, if it costs us $15,000 to finish out the basement, but we can get $200 more a month in rent that generates $20,000 more on the sales price on the back end, that would be a go decision. We're getting five, it's, it's a net $5,000 gain. So when we say IJM, we do know our numbers and we literally look at it from how much rent will that property get on the back end Therefore, how much can we sell it for? Then we go into whether that's a decision or not. I kind of love the IJM. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I, uh, during our, we, we put on a home building workshop at least once a month. We do these workshops. We have, you know, they're all Zoom now. We have over a couple hundred people that attend. We just had one last weekend and they're great, but I, I don't use the term. I'm probably going to steal that from the IJM. What I talk about, it's just math. I say just, it's all, this is all math. Everything's a mathematical equation. No matter what it is, no matter what you're doing in, in business, really, it comes down to a mathematical equation, right? Even the risk factor and all that stuff, it all comes down to that. If you can keep your mindset around that, I think it's better. I want to ask you something. What do you, so, so you hold on to properties yourself as, as rentals also, does your company do that or do you sell everything off? So I have accumulated, uh, I have 70 rental property of my own that my wife and I own. Um, we we're fortunate enough to be able to gobble them up um, actually all the way from 2002, um, you know, through and then a ton, you know, in that downturn, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Um, so currently we have such demand for our product that we're not holding much um, as a company. If demand ever wanes, um, would we do that? Absolutely. Um, we also have a pretty strong buyback program. So uh, we've only had to do it once, but um, you know, we tell people, hey, look, if you're not happy with the asset, we'll buy back. So um, oh, you know, well. we we stand behind our asset. Mm-hmm. We guarantee the rents for a year. We guarantee the rental rate for a year. I mean, you know, we believe in what we do. We we treat it like an investment, and so um, you know, and we 
coach our buyers on the front end to make sure we get the right kind of buyers, but then we make sure that we deliver an extremely good customer service experience so they feel good about it. So um, the long answer, but yeah, the short answer is simply no, we're not currently buying and holding, but it's not because we don't believe in our product. It's just, there's so much demand. We would be robbing ourselves of, of uh, gaining some, you know, of supplying our clients with what they're exactly looking for. Yeah, no, I, I asked that question because, you know, my life's been all about ever since I, my first company when I was 19 years old, this is going back to the eighties was uh, um, an alarm company when they have a monthly, monthly residual income, people pay a mo monitoring fee. Right. And I used to, you know, pay three bucks and charge 20. It was like, wow, I, this is nice. I got used to that residual income. And then, uh, you know, I was in, I was in network marketing for 10 years after that. And I had a full-time career for a while, but then I, I, we started real estate 15 years ago. And the, the goal, I always wanted the residual income. Amber wanted the money from flipping and she likes taking things that are ugly and making them pretty. And I like taking oh, things. Oh, but I like that residual too. <laughs> yeah. So we like that. So we're, we're, you know, we're, we don't have as many as you, we've got 43, 44 ish, um, houses that we own now. And so I, we are working on getting more of those and I, where I struggle is, I don't want to flip them. Like when they commit, sometimes I don't want to flip it. There, there is that chunk of cash up front, but I also want to build that residual to get up to be, you know, a couple hundred, 300, 500, a thousand homes that are always paying that rent. Cause I like that. You know, when I get older, right. Mark, I mean, you kind of, you start getting older. You think, well, I want to have that income coming in no matter what, you know? So no, I just that's curious, our curious your mindset there. Yeah, no, that literally now you're speaking my love language because I believe that real estate is a crockpot business, not a microwave business. It, you should be in the business of getting wealthy slowly over time, not getting rich quick. Because if you're just flipping, and you know you you have to, you, yeah you take the the hit now, but you you're, you're paying so much in taxes, and all you're doing is fa funding an active income stream. If you can buy and hold and build up a passive income stream, so even when you're not working, you have that residual income coming in. That's literally what we're preaching to our investors, and why we're encouraging them to to scale. So we want to work with fewer investors that are willing to scale with leverage and then power down their debt. So our model is simply, if you're not willing, if you're not thinking of doing it at scale, we're, we're not the right company for you. We want people, investors to, to change and give generational wealth uh, to change their lives through passive income. And so what we coach is to try and pick a number, you know, call it your freedom number of what you want to have as residual income coming from a stream of passive income of real estate. So if you're investing in the stock market, that's fine. Um, but what do you want to come just from real estate? Let's say that number is 20,000 in retirement. I want to have 20,000 coming. Okay, well, that's pretty easy math because we're going to generate on a paid off, keep in mind, a paid off piece of real estate in Kansas City. If you're getting 1300 a month in rent, you're going to get about 1900 Let's call it $1,000 a month of passive income. Okay, so we need around 20 to 22 properties that are paid off that will um, generate enough passive income for you to live on. Okay, so over the next five years, let's buy one per quarter, just slowly and systematically pick up quality homes in good areas with dialed in property management. These homes will appreciate over time. They'll build up um, this, this portfolio of, of passive income. And then when you get to 2025, you slowly start paying down that debt with, well, I would say slowly, aggressively, potentially paying down that debt so that when you hit your retirement, you've got these 20 homes that are paid off and you can use that paid off passive income as a means of enjoying your retirement. At our, at our work, we say a lot of the same things, Mark. We say a lot of, we're going to have to hang out a little more. We, we talk the same language a lot. And, um, when uh, at our workshops on Sundays at our workshop, we do a, we do a program, um, a workshop piece called what's your fin? It's your financial independence number. And I, I have a worksheet that does all this. Like, how, you know, what, what are your expenses? Where do you want to be? What's the basic life? What's an enjoyable life? What's a dream life? You know, and then what's the, what's the, what are those numbers? Like I say, cause that financial independence number is not as far, not, not as far away as you might think, you know, you start looking at that. And I say to how many houses you have to buy, do you want to leverage them? Do you want to cash? You know, so I, I love that you take it to another level and say, listen, let's, let's get you a plan to do one a quarter. That's even a different, that's even another level that I like. Like, here's what, what is your goal? Right. And then, and then again, it's IJM, like you said, it's just math. I also love that you do uh, quality over quantity and you know, you're not, you're not <clears throat> dealing with investors. You know, sometimes people think the more people I have coming and, and that's just not the case. This is like a case where less is more, you know, if you can focus on a few investors to help build your business and 
supply and that's like less headache for you in the long run too. Yeah. And you can deliver a phenomenal customer experience to a smaller amount of people, right? Yeah. It's hard to be all things to all people, even, even your time. I mean, how many, how many phone calls could I take if I were a small guy doing it on my own, you know, from a hundred investors, it would just, you know, even if you're trying to give them just one hour a week, it's like, I mean, one hour a month, that's a hundred hours a month that are just gone. Um, of conversations. But if you have 10 guys, I can handle 10 hours in a month, just, you know, building relationships or sipping on a cup of coffee with them and, and telling them, Hey, where do you want to get to? What are we doing? How's the house going? Cause people do take pride in what they do. Um, so, but it, it's, yeah. So building wealth for other people is a great, is it's an area that the real estate industry has failed. Most people, when they go to a job and they sit down and and get on board it's okay sign up for your 401k and you're going to put money away here and then you know they just get ingrained in this you know put money into the stock market rather than saving it yourself and then starting to invest it in real estate and those that can cater to people that want to invest in real estate because i will argue everyone does everyone i mean yeah. very few people don't want just would say real estate's a terrible asset class i think you could say if you could diversify even those that are just you know vehemently um, you know, aggressively putting money into the stock market would it would admit, hey, at some point, diversification is a nice thing. And so for those, if you cater to people and say, I'll give you a safe, secure way of buying quality homes in good areas. Again, we are not slumlords. We don't do anything like in bad war zones or bad parts of town, but quality homes in good areas with dialed in property management, which will reduce the two big killers of cash flow, which are vacancy and maintenance. So if you have dialed in property management, reducing vacancy and maintenance, this is a, uh, a sure thing. We, we, with our properties, I have been, I have been adamant that we don't want to do property management at this level, right? Um, so we've got, like I said, 40 plus houses and it was probably about a year or so ago. We had 30, some, whatever we had or, or whatever. And I remember saying, you know what? We paid our property management company. It, it was like 60 grand that year, let's call it, whatever it was. And I remember saying, you know, that's a lot of money. So I said, let me, let me see that report. And I got this stack of report of all of the things they did the year. I was about four pages through market. I went, yeah, you're good. You're good. You're, good. You're, good. you're doing good. And so I, we, we preach that, you know, when you're small, don't do it. I, and I, I don't know if you did, you may disagree. That's okay. I just, we, we preach when, when you're small, don't do it because it takes so much time, but no, um, we, we preach to have a property manager. Right. I'm right. sorry. Don't do it. Don't do it yourself. Yeah. Don't do it yourself don't when you're small. Right. That's what I meant. Yourself. Don't do it yourself when you're small, but. You, you know, I think you, you and I talk, you've got levels that you know where it starts to make sense. I'm curious what your thoughts are when someone's starting out, they've got four, five, six, ten units themselves. You and I both know that could be a major headache if you're not kind of systemized for that. Yeah. So I would absolutely, I, I, I would consider myself an expert in this topic, having been there and done that for the last 20 years. So my viewpoint is if you're buying, rehabbing and doing things yourself and it's just you and you've just got like two or three properties. I have no problem with someone trying to save the expense and and you know understand the pain of finding a good tenant and like <laughs> going through it, right. It's kind of <laughs> like, hey, you want to do that to yourself and and really get some scar tissue? Okay, great. Because eventually you need to trust a professional. If you get you know, don't be cheap and think that ten percent isn't worth it or eight percent isn't worth it. When someone's doing it at scale, there's so many be added benefits of a really good CRM of um, you know, high-end systems of, and processes and procedures that will, um, which I can bore you with all the, the, the details of how our property management system works, but there's so many technological overlays that don't make sense for anyone doing like 100 properties or less that when we're doing 650 doors under management, we can actually spend the money and um, make it worth our while. So I would absolutely say, it's, and then, so if you're doing it yourself, yeah, again, if you want to feel some pain, try and do two or three. Once you get to three, make sure you interview and get that one of the biggest property management companies in town that's really tech savvy, um, that is not showing them themselves. They're doing digital showings um, that has, you know, great reporting metrics and a good dashboard for you so you can understand the numbers and what they're spending money on. And then if you're doing it for other people, absolutely, you should not be doing it yourself. If you're buying and managing for other people in a turnkey fashion, until you get to about 300 doors, it really doesn't make sense for you to be having a property management company. People think, oh, it's going to be a great source of income. It is an absolute loss leader um, until you get to about 300 doors when you can start actually gaining a little bit of money. I mean, I, it would if I showed you my p and it's not a, it's not real super impressive just on the property management company alone. Um, it's about 10% of our, our global income. So 
Um, again, it's an annuity, so it comes in now all the time. So as now that we've got to that critical mass, it's nice that it comes in every month. And honestly, when COVID hit, it was kind of a nice little, you know, obviously my rental property income was still coming in and my property management property money, management company was coming in. So it is a nice little annuity, but for those just starting out, it's a distraction. So can, let me ask you, so is it possible for like, let's say our listeners are, are saying, look, I've got a few properties and I like the idea of turnkey and I want to maybe start doing that. Can they do that? And then use a property management company to manage those properties. And they build a relationship with a local property management company so that they don't have to manage it themselves. And because again, there's Absolutely. not much money in that. Yeah. And if that's smart, um, they should they should hedge, right? So they should um, preach to their owners that, hey, I'm going to charge you 10% because we're really good at what we do. And I've got a great property management team. Then go to the property management company and say, hey, can I get this done at 7%? And I'm going to give you all of these deals. And, and, and then they'll get 3%. Just, just for being that buffer and still maintaining and managing and, and looking at the reports, holding the property management company. It's like an additional layer for the owner. So the owner gets a really good experience. And then I would also say that the relationship that I had with my property management company when I outsourced it, because again, I wanted to be expert at acquisition and remodel. The, the property management was a distraction to me at the time. And so until we got, I let it get to about 300 doors and I just was very open and honest with the property manager saying, hey, look, one day I may knock on your door in four or five, six years time and say, I'm going to take them all back and do it all myself. And when that day came, he was sad to see me go, but I took 320 doors and said, thank you so much. And now I'm going to go do it myself. So, um, and, and we did it. We're frankly doing it way, way, way better now that, um, you know, we have the right people in place. I mean, you know, when you control everything, you can put that level of, um, you know, the, the level of detail that you want to have for your whole experience. I'm just fanatical about giving my clients a, an amazing experience. Like there are very few owners that have ever left us. I think one or two that, um, you know, over hundreds of properties. And I think that's just a dedication to my team and staff. We're just relentlessly saying, hey, your tenants are not the customer. Our owners are the customer. We're very owner centric. We don't upcharge on any of the maintenance. We don't ding them for any fees. We're just a flat 10% and they love it. Love us for that. That's great. Yeah. Well, man, this has been a great talking with you, a great experience learning what you do with turnkey because we've never really dealt, you know, done a lot with turnkey. And it's, it's great to know the ins and outs and how you think and how your brain works around that. That's been uh, great. I'm sure our listeners are getting a, a ton out of it. And some of them probably have their heads going, I don't know what I just heard. So you might want to listen to it again if you're not sure. <laughs> some of that stuff. And remember that it's just that. <clears throat> yeah. And it's there's just there were so many golden nuggets in this yeah. past in this in this podcast. Just if even from my level, just to hear that. And I think if whoever is listening out there, no matter what level you're at, listen to it again. If this is something that you're intrigued about or whatever. Um, by all means, this is another great way. I think take, taking the mistakes of I learned so many golden nuggets. I wrote down here. You know, it's a crockpot business, not a microwave business. That was great. Velocity of capital was great. Um, the IJM certainly have used that like crazy since we started here today. The IJM was great. So. This has been this has been awesome, Mark. I, I appreciate you being here and tell everybody again how they can reach, how they can find you, connect with you, get your book, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm passionate about giving back and the way that I'm doing that currently is um, you know, through the book, um, as well as my podcast, the Mistake Free Real Estate Podcast. Um, but yeah, I would just encourage everybody out there. Look, real estate is a is a life-changing event. It's a lifestyle, right? And you know, those that are flipping, that's that's great. But just remember that, you know. The, the delayed gratification is a sign of maturity. And I think never more so than with real estate. I think those that will delay the gratification knowing, hey, look, I could I flip and make 20 grand on this house right now? Yes, but it's a great rental in a really good area. And I'm just going to hold this for a long period of time. If I went back and looked, and I recently did, about the appreciation of, between what I bought, these what I'm all into these houses for and what they're worth now, Real estate will double in value every 20 years. In a bad part of town, it's going to double in value every 30 years. But in, in the good parts of town that your clients are going to buy buying them in and your, your listeners, every 20 years, real estate will double in value when you get a good buy. Um, and so, you know, when I say be in it for the long haul, I mean, just create this passive flow of income and then embrace a good property management company to help you uh, get, get a, to do it mistake free. Awesome. Yep. That was fantastic, Mark. I appreciate you being here. Guys, connect with Mark. Go get his book. It's awesome. He's obviously a great leader. He's one of the best and biggest in the country. And uh, you've had a privilege of listening to Mr. Mark Delatour today. So, Mark, thanks, buddy. Thanks. Guys, Thank we'll you see you all on the next podcast.